This is going to be a really long video because it's three parts of what college information I want to give to you, the junior class here, as you are about to finish up this year and embark into your college year with the world of applications and all that coming up. So uh, hopefully this demystifies college for you a little bit. I know like you're in CCA and you might be in like a program or something to guide you through this process altogether. Um, this is just to give you a little bit more of like a, it's not that bad type of talk and to go over some of the things to keep in mind of as these next few months roll by and to not procrastinate and find yourself in a problematic hole as you are in your senior year. So there's three things I want to cover um, in this video. The first one being um, just how to apply to college in the first place and what are you looking for when you're applying to these colleges. Number two, I want to talk about FAFSA and how to apply for some financial aid and to, you know, not make college way out of purchasable range um, and to get a little help there, but also the last one to talk about PIQs. And that kind of bleeds a little bit into scholarships, I guess, but uh, the PIQs are also tied with like the common app. So it's more so when you're applying for the UCs and the privates that this will matter. But um, even if you're looking for scholarships, like I mentioned, uh, you're still gonna write some essays about yourself and your character and these prompts that really just kind of compete against other people to see if your character, your caliber warrants some money. So. Excuse me, without further ado, let's go ahead and talk about college then and to see what you got to do to get in the best, um, I guess, like, option. Just whatever's given to you, right? Uh, there'll be timestamps for whatever section you want to look at specifically. So in that order, right, how to apply to college um, and what colleges to look for, the FAFSA stuff, and the later PIQs. This is a longer one, and I'm going to excuse myself and, like, pardon myself for messing up here and there more because it's it's hard to, like go unrehearsed, I guess, into something as long as this here, a lecture like that. So first and foremost, I want to cover these items here, starting with the colleges. Let's talk about general college pathways. So you have um, these typical five, you're going for like more conventional college options, right? You have your communities, you have your CSUs, UCs, privates, and IVs. This is like more the context of um, California, obviously, right? Like when you go to other states, they have their own state colleges and so forth, but otherwise we'll be covering it in the context of California here. So uh, you're in community college right now with EVC, so you should have some familiarity with that, but the other ones might have a little bit more of a mystery to them altogether. Let's talk about tuition first. Let's talk about how much it costs to go to college. Give me a second. Let me just check and see if the picture's big enough for you. Uh, it's a little small. It's fine. You, you'll get access to the slides, by the way, so you should be okay. Um, when you're looking at community college, right, you're looking at usually about 1364. This is kind of like at the EVC level. I took these numbers from particular schools and from uh, their websites, right? But for EVC, in the context of a year, you are looking at 1364, which is pretty affordable. You know, when you're looking at um, the year-to-year, year year-to-year, nine-month student budget that you should be uh, requiring to pay for college, like, that's pretty good, and that's why CCs are a super affordable and uh, viable way to get through college to get your degree, whether you do it um, some years, all years, what have you, right? So uh, community colleges are definitely an option there. The only problem is that a lot of community colleges do not offer full-on bachelors and things past that. Some of them are starting to offer that, but usually you get an associate's degree, which is the two-year process there. And I mean, some jobs only need that much, but um, it's really what you're looking for, right? CSUs, you're looking for a lot more. If you look at the semester, semester already is uh, double almost, the more, a little bit more than double community colleges here. So semester, you're looking at about 2.8K, right, to pay every semester, adding up to about 5.7K for the academic year. It's not a fun price to pay, but um, that's what you're looking at as you go higher and higher in these kind of like categories of um, paying for college there. So it's why we got to talk about FAFSA later and scholarships to really alleviate that. UCs, you're looking at 12570, five digit realm. Damn. And that's, that's four years, you know what I mean? I'm talking about paying that for four times uh, your entire, that's that's pretty much a yearly salary for a lot of people. That's quite a lot of money for an education there. So you'd really gotta make sure you have some financial aid there or some ways of paying that off. So UCs, that's a whole different ballpark now in terms of costs. And again, it is like, you know, we're going higher and higher up in terms of like prestige and also um, titles for schools here, but it, it's, Money, the money game in these institutions really rack up. And if you're looking at privates, they can be 
18k and sometimes even higher. Um, I think this was pulled by, I can't remember if it was Stanford or Harvard's, but when you're looking at these kind of like Ivy League type schools, uh, the tuition is really up there. Granted, there are a lot of like opportunities that they do to cut down those costs, but you can kind of see the how far we've gone from the community college world to the privates there in terms of cost, right? Uh, in common community colleges that people choose around California, or at least our, our general vicinity, right? We got like our EBC, De Anza, Ohlone, um, Mission Foothill, and San Jose City College, which they all have their own perks and their own environments and their own offerings there. So, um, I mean, none is better than the other. It's just the idea of like, where do you want to go and what's most like accessible to you there, right? Um, it's not too bad to get into a community college. It's actually required, the requirements are pretty short and um, succinct, right? So all you got to really be is just 18 years of age, high school graduate, that you have a California proficiency examination passed, which is pretty much just having a degree in the first place, right? Um, holding a GED or be officially approved by his or her high school district if under 18, which is which, what you're going through right now because you're, you're, you're being approved by our program here or you have a GED, which um, is a, uh, I guess, unconventional path uh, alongside of high schools where you have your like kind of general education done through that way there. Um, but otherwise, yeah, that's all you really need to go into ACC. You sign up as you normally would for anything here. I think you guys have some experience signing up. So you just go to the website, you put your full name, date of birth, and all that information there. So there will be some paperwork you need from parents and what have you. Um, and then you just kind of fill it out step by step. It's either a digital or a paper form. You just fill out everything in the order and straightforward questions. And then once you submit it, you are pretty much good. Now, you, all you got to consider from that point on to is what you're going to sign up for in terms of status. So there's oftentimes full-time status students and half-time students. Um, the difference being that if you're full-time, you have the general requirements. You can go past that if you petition for usually, right? But if you have 12 or more, and this is going to be the general number for like most schools altogether, it means that you're paying for that general full-time price and you get, you get access to like all the kind of um, functions of the college, right? Half-time is uh, six to 11 units, so you're going short underneath and it's usually more viable to, economically viable to go full-time just because when you're half-time, you're still paying at a very exorbitant fee, but you're not, you might not even get your money's worth because you're not taking enough classes altogether, right? So it's really kind of encouraging you to do full-time if possible, but if you need to like work or you have some life issues and whatnot, then later maybe half time is going to be your option there. So just kind of thinking about like what you can sign up for, but um, to just get the most bang for your buck because college is expensive. Now they give you fees and these are all recommendations, right? A lot of colleges will give you some ideas in terms of like what you gotta buy and how to like, you know, upkeep and all that. Uh, all we really need to keep the focus of is pretty much the top part here, which is your, um, you know, tuition, because everything underneath is just kind of their estimation of like what you gotta pay and how much everything will generally cost. So you see like this big whopping number, you're gonna be like, oh my goodness, 15.697K, that's crazy. Um, not really, right? It's more so like, subjective to each person's experience there. So it could be that much, but it could be way less, obviously, from the year to year. So just keep in mind the fees. Um, usually they will have some other things tied into the tuition that they kind of give you an idea of, of what you're buying into, right? So enrollment fee, there's that cost, health fee. Uh, you get access to the health center, so that's nice, a little perk for you. Uh, transportation fee, if you are getting, excuse me, for example, like a bus pass, whatever. Um, you also pay for different functions around the school. So they do document like, how your fees aren't just your classes, it's also the different like benefits, benefits and bonuses that you get across the school there. Uh, every school usually have an orientation. You basically just go toward the school, get your ID cards. We would normally do this in person, but because of the whole like COVID and pandemic situation, um, we usually just kind of do everything digitally now. But for a lot of colleges, they do like you to do an orientation. That's kind of like the seal in that you're going to commit to it. And during the orientation, you also uh, do your, um, what do you call it? your, did I say this already? Your sign-ups, right? So you're basically signing up for classes and you're getting ready for the beginning of your school year should you choose to be at that school. But usually if you do orientation, it's going to be like the kind of um, thumbs up, the kind of like I'm committing to this movement here. Uh, you're going to pick your courses and your major. This is going to be a tricky thing to talk about as you go through on your, your not your life, your end of junior, beginning of senior life, even your end of senior life, because it's not an easy choice, obviously, right, to commit to something here. And for a lot of people, they will not have anything when they go to college. They'll be like, oh, hey, I don't know what I'm passionate about yet. That's absolutely fine. It's fair. Um, a lot of people have that kind of um, struggle, I guess, right? And it's something that 
it's better if you do have a plan going to college, but if you don't, there's no big worry either. You can definitely find something there, but just keep in mind, there's a couple of factors I want to mention because of this here. So during orientation, they'll usually ask you about what major you're interested in. You don't have to answer that necessarily. You have two years and you can take classes undeclared, meaning you can go into college and be like, hey, I have no major yet, but I eventually will find one. And they're like, cool, we'll give you some time, right? Uh, here's the thing I want to talk about. The majors that... Uh, have preliminary classes, those are called impacted. So these last two sections here, impacted majors mean that they want you to absolutely know that you are going to go commit to that. And a lot of uh, majors that are impacted include things like nursing or um, computer sciences because they have like very, very specialized courses that you have to take then to um, get into and have mastery over, right? So that's why if you were like two years wandering without really like knowing what you want to do and you suddenly want to pick up nursing, it would probably either be really hard to do so or there would be like some definite barriers that keep you out of it there. So they are impacted. Keep that in mind as you are signing up for schools and for majors. Uh, every school give you a pacing guide. So what that means is they will give you all the credits you need for school to graduate and i've put the english one up because it's the one i pretty much used right and they'll tell you like hey you need this much for uh lower division classes your ge's right this much for upper division this much for foreign language this much for blah 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 and it all adds up to their total unit so you can keep track of it on the website to get an idea like where you are in terms of your college career it's not like a random situation you know what i mean where you just kind of go through and you're like am i graduated yet no? All right, I'll keep going. It's not like that. It's not that mysterious, obviously. And usually it's encouraged that in your second and third year, you talk to your counselor just to make sure you're on the right track and to make sure that you have your goals and priorities set all together. So some final things to consider about, consider about community college, but just colleges in general. Um, you're just making sure that you're registered, made an account, and you're admitted to make sure that you attend an orientation, to make sure that you're picking a major either then or later on, and to register for your classes online according to your pacing guide, right? So making sure that you're picking classes that are appropriate and pertaining to graduation. So some final thoughts about community college. Is it worth it? Of course it is, right? A lot of people take the college, uh, community college pathway because it is such a uh, saver of money. And the first two years when you're doing your GEs, it's kind of wherever you go, right? Just make sure your classes do transfer because some colleges will only take some classes from another college if it's on their list. But for the most part, uh, community colleges are oftentimes seen as transfer schools or oftentimes seen as uh, places where people kind of like figure themselves out before they go into the actual schools they want to attend. So it's entirely how you want to treat your community college experience should you choose to attend. I think the only issue with community colleges really is just the stigmas that go with them. Um, a lot of people do look down on community colleges, sadly, and there is um, an unfairness to it because, I mean, it does such a service for a lot of people, right, to save that money and to really provide an inexpensive um, option for those who are trying to attend college, especially if they're first generation without that sort of like foundation of finances, right? So community colleges, a definitely definite consideration here. It is not a bad choice. And some people even go through all the years if it's offered, right, for like that sort of bachelor um, degree that's offered through community colleges there. CSUs, the next step here, state colleges. And there's more than just San Jose State, obviously, right? You have a bunch all scattered throughout California, but um, in the CSUs, we have a little bit more of requirements needed because the acceptance rate isn't just 100%. Um, with a couple of checklisting items here, there is a little bit more competition when it comes to your CSUs. You're looking at high school diploma, like usual. You need to complete required high school courses with grades of C minus or better. So I think that exempts some like electives or whatever, but in terms of your core classes, you gotta get a C minus or better, um, largely. Excuse me. Otherwise, you definitely will be kind of like scrutinized or um, kind of filtered through, right? This is an older factor, which isn't a big deal anymore, if at all, submitting SAT or ACT scores. So SAT has largely been ruled out at the UC level. CSUs will still kind of consider them, but in, in as a whole, besides some privates and scholarships, SATs have lost their sort of like grounding and their significance to... Um, the kind of like higher education world, right? Like if you do it, cool. If you did really well in it, cool, send it in. It's like a cherry on the top, right? If you're competing with somebody else, it might kind of like make a little bit of a push for you, but it's not, it's a non-factor um, by and large, or it's more so that now. So SATs don't have to worry too much about. Um, CSU minimum eligibility index. So making sure that you have a GPA high enough. I think um, YB used to have like this sort of, pathway to SGSU, this promise that we had, um, this program where you, I think if you had like a two point, 
I want to say just five, something like that, right? Like 2.5, you'd be okay to go to SGSU. Like you would have like a nice little pipeline there. But I think they did re rise it in recent years. I think it's now like 2.75 or 2.8. Anyways, it's not like too bad, but there is kind of like a general um, grade point average expectation from school to school. And uh, the kind of tricky thing as you're looking at this next frame here is that every school is going to have their general acceptance rate um, published and it doesn't really like say what your chances are just because of your GPA. So I'll give you an example, right? In this picture, it said that in 2018, the past or uh, acceptance rate was 55.22. And let's say that the average GPA admittance is 3.45, right? That does not mean that if you have a GPA lower than that, you'd be denied. It doesn't mean that suddenly from 2017 to 2018, SGSU suddenly became more difficult to get into. Um, it's just depends on um, how the population of the school is looking. It, it looks at the general like um, graduating classes of that year. There's a lot of factors that go into it. So it doesn't mean like, you know, if you have this sort of like um, GPA background or just general background, you're instantly denied. No, it's not like that. There is a lot more to consider, but just keep that in mind that um, a higher GPA is obviously nicer to have, right? It just keeps you competitive and it keeps you kind of like up for considerations there. So as an overview, basically to get into your CSUs, you have to meet requirements, you gotta choose a major or not, same thing, you can be undeclared, right? Uh, you apply to your CSU college, whatever it might be, online, paper, same thing. You check your email for your ID. It's very much like EVC, essentially, or community colleges. Um, you check your accounts for next steps, and SATs, graduate your high school with your A through G, higher than C minus stuff. So it's pretty much like community college, just with a little bit more oomph to it, right? A little bit more competition to it. It's not like a guarantee or an absolute to get into your CSUs here. Um, there are some more things you gotta do when you're applying for CSUs, though. So there's usually a little bit more... Um, transcript asking, paperwork asking there. So you're gonna to have to get those from your counselors. Um, again, orientation exists. There's a deposit of $100. So it's kind of like a, a, it's like a down payment, I guess, right? To make sure that you're kind of committed, more committed to that school there. Um, paying tuition, picking classes. They do make sure, I think your first year that you do your math and English is first. Kind of like the big, I guess, like, items of school altogether, right? Oh yeah, and making sure you have your shots. Um, when you go to your, um, I'm not sure if it's UC required as well, but for CSU, at least from my, my experience and from the website, you had to have your shots, your vaccinations and all that there. Um, back then it was for TB, but now it's for um, obviously the COVID vaccine and all that. So a little extra criteria there. So final stats from ES CSUs, they are standard for your bachelor degree um, schools that kind of offer your standard um, education each one has their own and i mean each one is in each school right has their own focus and their own kind of like priorities and um what they're notable for um how would i explain it uh csus are kind of like job schools basically your whole goal in going to a csu isn't for like higher learning necessarily or research it's to get the skills and then get to work so in this case csus are more like i guess practical college options here um, to make sure that you have like an actual connection to life later on, right? Then you have your UCs. UCs have a lot more requirements, not a lot more, more requirements to apply for because there's some extra little hoops and barrels to jump through. So you need your transcripts, you need test scores, talking about your APs, your SATs. Again, SAT is a little bit less than, but your AP scores do matter because you can get credits for those and they can uh, kind of like, again, bring attention to you as a candidate, annual income, so they can see what your background is to accommodate and to um, offer certain financial aids or just kind of see where you're from, social security number, citizenship status, California statewide student ID, credit card. This stuff here, by the way, it looks like a longer list, but it's stuff that you already had to do for your like EVC and CSU stuff. So just kind of like more listed out, right? And speaking of list, there's like a longer, excuse me, list that comes up, but there's just a little bit more that goes into UCs. So the application process is a little bit different. Um, they do ask you to uh, choose a series of campuses that you want to apply to within the UC system. They ask for academic history, so kind of like um, not even just your grades, just things that you've done altogether throughout your 9th through 12th grade experience, right? Test scores, activities and awards, scholarships, personal insight questions. We'll talk about the end of this video here. Um, they wanna know you more so as a person. This is kind of like a more formal interview of an application, whereas the community college application is more um, kind of like you sign up, you get in. CSU is more about like, okay, you fit this general like 
um, student, I guess, like demographic we're looking for, like this just general pool of candidates that we're looking for. Uh, UCs are a little bit more picky. UCs are a little bit more like pick and choose, and there's a little bit more. Um, I wouldn't say a little bit more. So there's, there's definitely a lot more um, competition when it comes to getting into your UCs and all that, right? So when you are applying for UCs, just make sure you're on top of your game and that everything you've done in high school is accounted for and documented well. Speaking of lists, whew, there's a lot of items to go through. So, I mean, it's all stuff that we kind of largely talked about, but anywho, uh, just make sure that you are following along what they're looking for and asking for in the application. Like I mentioned, they do ask for, if you look at number one, academic grade point average of your A through G courses. So they're thinking about like, you know, how you did as a student, right? But not just that, they're also asking for, if you look at number 11, special talents, achievements, awards. So really anything that makes you stand out more is a factor to put into your application. It's a really nuanced to look at who are you as a person. Now your privates and IVs are pretty much the same. There's not too much difference when you're applying from like community college all the way to privates. The general process is still very much the same, but at the same time, your privates um, they will ask for a little bit more questions usually that pertain to them. For privates, luckily, it's a little bit easy in terms of um, not having to apply to all these individual ones. There is the common app website over here that I linked here um, where you can apply to those particular, you know, privates to just kind of browse and see which ones you would want to apply to. It's all the same mainframe, basically. So um, you don't have to like go to like a thousand different websites or whatever, right? So you can just go there and look for your privates. Uh, the difference is that well, every private college seeing the site can be easily added to your account. Like I mentioned, every college asks for something different that they need. So every college will be like, hey, let me get your like, social security number, let me get your you know, address, whatever, it's basic stuff, right? But some might ask like, hey, how did you tackle the COVID year? What's your dreams and aspirations? Who are you as a person? They'll ask for like a 550 word essay, they'll ask for 350, they'll ask for 50, like a bunch of 50 word um, uh answered questions there. So it's going to be like varying in, you know, part to part for these colleges here. So like I said, they're writing samples. They'll be asking for those. Um, some colleges will ask for additional paperwork, whatever they ask, you just give them if it pertains to you. Um, some colleges ask for letter recommendations. So if you are applying to, well, this isn't really college per se, but some students have asked in the past if they're applying to a college via like a program or like a, a scholarship or opportunity, um, they will need letters of rec. So you just ask your teachers. Usually it's, it depends. It's either like two teachers of major subjects or it's a teacher and your counselor, or whatever it is, right? So you're just going to ask those people for... Um, for their feet, not feedback, for their inputs, I guess, and for their kind of like vouching of your character and your abilities, and just kind of like add a little bit push for you there. Um, a little bit of Rex, those are kind of tricky to talk about because this here, you don't want to ask anybody, right? Because you want to pick the teacher or the person to write the letter for you who best can. The person who has the most insight about you, the person who can uh, speak well of your character, um, you know, like. Just use me as an example, right? If you might be cool with me, but I don't really know your abilities and achievements, that might not be the best choice because let's say there's a teacher who you're not as cool with, but you can they definitely know what you can do and you did really well in that class. That might be a better choice than just some thoughts, right? Whoever can write the best letter for you because there have been instances in the past where I'm like, yeah, I'll gladly write one for you, but I don't really know much about you. So it's really hard to squeeze any like, you know, substantial stuff about you to put on paper there that's that's just an issue to you know consider but anywho uh that's just one factor to consider for your um private applications and again it sounds complicated but don't worry every college that you ever you ever apply for it's just gonna be like a checklisting of things from top to bottom so it's not too bad so the final thoughts on ucs and privates it's cultural if anything it is more rigorous um depending on where you go. There are some great research opportunities and some great just internships and all that offered. And that's kind of like the focus of these UCs and privates, right? The whole idea is you go there for that higher education, but it might not be like job preparing necessarily. It's more for the pursuit of education and knowledge sometimes there. And it's also to meet certain types of people too. Um, a lot of jobs will go to UCs to, you know, scout for different candidates. Sometimes you will meet people there who are kind of, you know, well connected and you can make those connections there yourself to get into jobs. So I think as you go to the UCs and private worlds, you just get a little bit more access and more of your foot in the door for uh, companies, for scouters and all that there. FASA. 
So this is the next part of the video about financial aid. And FAFSA is not just the only financial aid, but it's one of the big ones, right? One that um, we definitely encourage and push for every year. So it's not a hard process. Don't be scared about FAFSA. All you really gotta do is go to the website, uh, depending on who you are, are you new, are you returning, you just click on the one that applies best to you. And then later, um, the only thing that you have to keep in mind is you have to renew this account every year. So you do uh, have to make sure you kind of like re-input everything and all. And the reason why you do that, because every year your, um, your uh, tax report might be different. So they do want to make sure that everything's up to date regarding you there. I don't like your bourbon. It's just damn coffee. It keeps making burp. I say that. Is I drink more. All right. So you go to the website, and what's going to happen is you're going to log in with the ID that uh, they ask you to do. It's not your FAFSA ID. You know, what's that? It's not your um, FSA ID. It's your uh, what do you call it? Hold on. Oh, I read this and I got mixed up. Sorry. You log in with your FSA ID, of which if you don't have one, sorry, you're going to make one real quick here by clicking on this link that they provide for you up there. And this ID is usually done through um, going to the second portal and then using your student ID, your California uh, state ID number to fill in. So you're going to have to get that number and that information from your counselor sometime in the future. Um, so you can apply for FAFSA there. Um, and in that website, as again, it's like a nice quick checklisting of things, your name, your date of birth and all that. And later, of course, whatever pertaining California ID stuff as a student they want from you there. And once you've done that, you've made your student FSA ID, you can sign to FAFSA and then do what FAFSA needs from you there. So for FAFSA, they ask for this stuff. Basic information, like they always do. Social security number, uh, making a save key, your password, your parents' finances, and your finances if you've worked before. So you do want to make sure that you keep track of all the stuff, your tax returns here. They will ask for it year by year. So um, just, you know, if you haven't been very careful with that stuff there, do start because um, that will be kind of like the determiner of how much you get from FAFSA there. So you want to make sure that you do that um, as accurately as possible. It's nice to start asking for this doc these documents, um, maybe like even at the end of summer-ish, just prepare them, just make sure your parents have them and everything, right? Um, and to get ready to sign up for FAFSA once it opens in October. Process timeline looks like this here. What's gonna happen is uh, you sign up for FAFSA, right? You fill out everything, you submit everything. And once you do, they'll let you know that your FAFSA was processed. And then later your school might require more information, but if it doesn't, then you're cool to sit tight and chill. Uh, what's gonna happen is first time applicants, you receive an offer aid from your school. And then later you can review it, kind of figure out which school is giving you the best opportunities. And then you pick, you know, the one that you would most, I guess, want to choose uh, with all those benefits and all that. Once you are in that school, what you're going to do is, like I said, renew every year. Once you renew it, they'll give you the aid offer. You accept to it, and then you get that money, receiving it and using it for, um, you know, anything from books to tuition to whatever, right? So FAFSA, nice financial aid process there. Let's say your parents are missing their tax returns, though. This is still okay. So FAFSA application, they can access the IRS data directly. Um, all they need at this point is, um, I, I forget what form it is exactly. I'll, I'll, I'll put in the um, descriptions and all that with this video here, but there's another form that your parents can submit that it's kind of like, it's like I don't have my actual forms, but um, I'll submit my information so the IRS can dig it up for me basically. And if your parents are not citizens and don't live in the US, they can opt for a foreign country. That's absolutely fine. There's no big deal with that there. Um, they can definitely like, you know, work around it to give you that financial aid there. And if the parents make below the minimum to file taxes, which then, you know, they don't have um, those documents there, they can provide their W-2, 1099, pay stub, basically like how much your parents made. So the school can be like, oh, this is how, you made, how much you made. Okay, that makes sense to me there. So in this case, just, just as long as you have like the money information ready and settled, you are good to go for FAFSA. And afterwards, you basically wait about like seven to 10 days for processing uh, based on the kind of like uh, factors and standards and all the criteria they give you that expected number um, for the you know money that you can use. And then later you have issues, you can just like, you know, notify, notify them and then later um, you have to wait a little longer, but correct it if you need to, right? Um, that's about it for this here. 
And if you have any questions about any of this stuff too, like once you're actually in college, like I mentioned here at the end of this slide, most schools do have like a financial document area to keep track of. Um, so if you've ever had any questions about FAFSA, like, am I doing this right? Or like, where's my money? Or like, what's going on? You just go there and then later, um, you know, ask and be like, hey, can you help me with this? And like, yeah, cool. Uh, like, for example, San Jose, San Jose State's um, department for that is underneath the 10th Street garage. So all you would just do is go there. I've done it a bunch of times because my friend would go there all the time and do his FAFSA there. And I'll just like follow him and watch. You just go to the room. They inquire. Give, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> this coffee is killing me. <coughs> excuse me. Inquire about uh, your, your situation. Give them all the paperwork that they need and then later, bada bing, bada boom, you're good. Um, how much does FAFSA pay? I gave you some estimations about it here. It's not exact all the time, but this is just like how much people will get on average, right? So let's take EVC as an example. FAFSA, 63% of students average is about 9.4K, which is a lot of money. That's more than tuition of the year, right? Which means that anything else afterwards can be done uh, for other life needs that you have. So this is a really great way to... Um, get some funding to essentially survive and make it through this college experience without all these like turmoils and all that right uh sjsu for example is 14.2k berkeley was 24.5 uh, and then later harvard uh, a nice cool 57.2k it's quite a lot of money you do not want to miss out on this here and obviously it's not always going to be this much or like it's not the same for everybody because your condition your situation is going to like you know affected there but uh just be careful with like some of these large numbers though because sometimes the tuition is inflated because they do understand that there is going to be like this outside help that funds and kind of subsidizes the education so i mean it's nice for you but just they're not being generous for the hell of it they also get paid essentially right Whew. okay my throat's dying so one last wig before we go into our last and shortest section here the personal insight questions and common app questions If you are only applying for community college and CSUs, you don't need to worry about this here. I mean, you can if you like, if you're curious, but this only pertains to UCs and privates here. So what's going to happen is these colleges want to know more about you. These are kind of like interview questions, but they're written more in like a narrative kind of way where you're describing your life and um, giving them, huh, surprise, insight about who you are. Uh, for UCs, basically, you have eight questions to choose from, and you only need to respond to four of those eight questions. Every response is a limit of 350 words, and you can choose, uh, but you want to choose the ones that are best pertaining to you. Meaning, if you choose one, like, favorite subject in school, but you don't have one, I mean, it doesn't help, right? You're, you're going to write some, something that's, like, less, less genuine, not fully, you know, answerable from you as a person there. I said narrative earlier, and it is narrative. It is not an interview in the sense that you're like, hi, my name is, I do this. I, you know, it's not so rigid. It's not so formal. It's actually storytelling, right? So it is concise. It does require academic language and a writer's voice. But like I keep saying, it's storytelling. It's making yourself desirable. It's very anecdotal here. It is an interview, but it's not one where you're answering a series of questions to look professional or formal. It's more about how you're telling the story of show not tell so the person can make their own inferences about you here. And you're trying to not make a cliche because if you say, for example, I'm a first generation, you know, immigrant in this country here. Well, you and everybody else at YB, you know what I mean? Like, how do you stand out, basically? You can still write that story, don't get me wrong, but you have to write it in a way that makes you more, I don't know, as an outlier or somebody who just is more desirable as a candidate there. And with the SAT is gone, these personal insight questions are actually higher up now in terms of priority. Um, it's something that was, okay, so let's say this, right? Let's say GPA, achievements, SAT and personal insight questions were all 25% each in terms of the weighing scale. By taking out the SATs, everything is now at a cool 33% as just a frame of reference. So this now has a lot more basically importance and factoring for your application there. And what works usually are these kind of themes or these different type of um, uh, entry points. Stories of growth and overcoming difficulties. They don't, want to, they don't want to see you as a quitter. They don't want to see you as like somebody who like is cynical or like critical in a bad way right they want to see somebody who is like strong-willed and willing to push on they want stories of serving the community big or small 
They want stories of displaying leadership. They love leadership. They want people who are able to take charge and be um, full of, uh, I don't know, just tenacity, audacity, just, you know, the powerful type of um, auras to them there. And so again, a lot of show not tell. Don't tell them like, I am a great student. I don't know you. I mean, you have a nice GPA, but how do I know? How, did I know? how do I know that you didn't copy everything, right? Or cheated your way through? Let them know by impression. So the PIQ questions are all given to you online. You can start as early as now if you like. And I don't know if I want to, I would recommend you start this early. I think the general best time frame is the beginning of summer and then later all throughout, not like heavy writing where you're just like crunching out these stories as if you were an author trying to meet a deadline, you know what I mean? Um, just, you know, a little bit of writing here and there to kind of get the feel for it, just to make sure that you have a nice pacing for it. Uh, and each question asks for something different. Leadership, creative side, greatest talent or skill, um, overcoming educational barriers, significant challenges you faced, academic subjects you inspire you, uh, making school a better place or your community, and something that just in general you want to tell about you that's not asked here. So it's kind of like a free for all type question for you there, right? And they're all kind of like open ended for the most part, and it's up to you to answer it as best as possible. Common app for private colleges are pretty much the same. Uh, they're 650 words, but you only have to write one for these colleges here. So it's not like super long, um, but you get more wiggle room to write like a more complete story, I guess. And these stories are very much the same in terms of like the kind of focus, right? So your background, lessons you learned, time you question something, problem solving, accomplishments, topic ideas that engages you, anything you like, it's all up to you there. So here are your next steps. This is what you gotta do from this point on. As you are finishing your junior year, going to summer, and starting your senior year. Number one, think about majors you want to apply for. I don't care if you commit to them or not. Just start thinking about them so you have some general framework to work off of. Because if you walk in undeclared, that's fine. But it's not It's not ideal, right? You want to have like some ideas as to what you're applying for. You don't want to just be like lost for a long time there. So start kind of like researching, envisioning, brainstorming, whatever. Start gathering these documents, social security number, parents' tax returns, all that, right? Things that you might use for those applications. Start brainstorming schools. Look into programs that um, you might want to major in, things that look interesting for you to apply for and what they require. And then later for the UCs and privates, start on your PIQs, right? To make sure that you have some of those narratives started. So it's not too much, but if you don't do them by like, you know, the closeness of the due date of, college applications, a lot of this starts feeling really, really insurmountable. It's like, whoa, I don't really know if I can do it anymore, right? Don't put yourself in that corner. Do it as soon as possible. It seems like a lot, but I mean, if you think about it, applications, mostly checklisting and a little bit of writing here. FASPA, pretty much straightforward checklisting and PIQs right about your life. Not too bad, but it does require some thinking.